but Romans, the reason why it's a tough book is because it's really the, the most concise, succinct uh, group of doctrine in the entire Bible. See, Paul uh, never made it to Rome until he went to go face Nero. He was imprisoned um, by Festus and uh, by Felix. And he went on that two-week journey across the Mediterranean, shipwrecked on the island of Malta, um, and he, it was all because he had asked that he speak as a Roman citizen before the emperor. Paul had dual citizenship, um, both as a Hebrew um, and a Jew's Jew, as he called himself, because he was of the, the best tribe of Benjamin, and he had the best training under one of the, most, the best rabbis around, Gamaliel. But he also had dual citizenship with Rome, so he had the right to ask that he actually would take his case before the Caesar, and the Caesar at the time was a psychopath named Nero. Um, and the guy was crazy. Most historians agree that Nero um, either did it, probably not himself, but ordered people to burn Rome, right? And you've all heard Nero was, what, fiddling while Rome burned to the ground? I don't know if he was doing that. But he, it's, it's generally agreed that he did that, and he blamed it on Christians. When you read First and Second Peter and you see all of the persecution going on, that's all from Nero. He hated Christians, despised them as much as Satan does. So Paul, this was before then, and he was writing out of Corinth, and he wrote this letter to Romans. He, he'd never been there before, but it was a group of believers right in the heart of evil doctrine, right there in the middle of Rome, with all of their pagan gods and their temple prostitutes. And I mean, he was writing from Corinth, which had a really bad history of temple prostitution and pagan gods. But he wrote this to them, and it's because he had not started this church that it's such a, a, a nice group of doctrine. Because it's just he just covers everything. He just goes through it all. We're just going to go through only about you know fifty verses this morning. Oh man, I'm sorry. It was it was six verses. I apologize. Um, if you'll turn with me to Romans six, we're going to read verses nine through fourteen. Six Romans chapter six, verses nine through fourteen. I've got a, a New American Standard Bible in front of me, and there's, if you don't have a Bible with you, there's New American Standard Bibles right in front of you in the back of the pew. Romans 6, 9 through 14 says, That we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And that's kind of the title of the sermon, Under, under Grace. We are under grace now. And I've got four parts to it. If you want to take notes, there's little four sections, and they all start with an E, sort of. First one is Christ's exaltation, if you want to write that down. Christ's exaltation, the exaltation of Christ. And that's in verse 9. We know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Christ sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins. Yes? We all know that? All right. And his victory over that death and his resurrection has resulted in him now sitting at the right hand of God with the scepter of righteousness in his hands and his enemies as a footstool for him. He has dominion over all of creation now, and that includes death. That's why it says death no longer is master over him, or your version might say death no longer is dominion or has dominion over him. He has dominion over everything. That includes death. He died in the flesh once, and he now lives forever and ever. His spirit, of course, never died but he died in the flesh that one time for us. And if you'll turn to Hebrews 1 with me, keep a finger here in Romans 6, turn to Hebrews 1, we'll see what I, what I just described about the scepter of righteousness sitting at the right hand of God and his enemies as a footstool. I just want to make sure that you know I'm not making that up. Hebrews 1, and the entire chapter of Hebrews 1, 1 through 14. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention. Oh, excuse me, that's verse chapter 2, sorry. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. And we get to a series of quotes from the Old Testament now, speaking to the glory of Christ and to his deity. Verse 5, For to which of the angels did he ever say, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companions. And thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They will perish, but thou remainest. And they will all become old as a garment, and as a mantle thou will roll them up. As a garment they will also be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? And side note, I'm not sure how Jehovah's Witnesses get around this chapter. Maybe they just ignore it completely. But this whole chapter directly confronts their accusation that Jesus is merely the highest of created angels. And this is, tells you no, it's clear that he's not. Which of the angels are those things said? And the answer is a rhetorical question. He already knows the answer. It's none of them. But we see those things about, you can go back to, to Romans 6 now. We see those truths about Christ, right? A footstool for him. That's a big deal. You might think, oh, okay, so he rests his feet. No, feet were the, and possibly still are, the most disgusting part of a person's body in those days. They all wore sandals or went barefoot. They didn't have closed-toed shoes. They didn't have socks. So I'll let your minds do the rest. It's gross. And so that idea means that he has complete dominion. He has subjected everything to him. He is above it all now. And we need to understand that exaltation of Christ so that we can hopefully feel more compelled to follow him. Those are awesome pictures that we just read in Hebrews 1 of that exaltation that he possesses. And when it says that he has his enemies as a footstool, and I told you that death was included, that's said in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory since he is life death must be his enemy if we are friends of God we are enemies of the world if we're friends with the world we're enemies with God anything that is not him must be an enemy and if he is life then death is an enemy but he now has reign over that this verse verse 9 that we read it's also confirmation that our Lord had a great victory through his sacrifice and resurrection and victory always comes from him Always, every single time. It's never us. We are not victorious in and of ourselves. We do get to partake in that victory, but it's him that has that victory. It's always been him. It always will be him. If you go and you look at the times that Samson did great things, at the time that David chunked that rock into Goliath's head and then decapitated him, don't forget that part. It's pretty important. The rock didn't kill Goliath. But every time you see that, it always says the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. It was very clear that God's the one who brings victory. First Chronicles 29, 11, David prays, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything it is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. And that Hebrew word for victory there is pronounced netzach, and it means a, perfe- a perpetual victory, a victory that lasts forever and ever. Nobody, nothing can ever defeat God. So victory is from God alone. This is all wrapped up in this exaltation of Christ from verse 9. And this is exciting news, that victory comes from him and that it's forever and ever. Because through Christ, like I mentioned a little bit ago, we now too take part in his victory over death, sin, and Satan. 1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, and the Greek word there for victory, you guys are really familiar with, but it's always mispronounced, because the Greek word there is Nike, but you always see it and hear it pronounced as Nike, and that's where it comes from. That's the Greek word for victory. 
I don't know why they mispronounced it, but it's Nikkei. But it's just like that sports company. That's our victory over the world. And in 1 John 5.19, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So if we have victory over the world and the world lies in the power of the evil one, who does that mean we have victory over? Satan. That's right. We have victory over Satan. 1 Corinthians 15, 54-57 tells us, But when this perishable will have to put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's victory over death. So all wrapped up in Christ's exaltation, the fact that we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. That brings about all this victory. All of these victories come from that. And if we are partakers in the Lord, then we partake in that victory. And that means that we too will die in the flesh once, unless we get super blessed and the rapture happens instead. Because God doesn't like death. Death is the opposite of him. It's an enemy. So if the rapture happens, that's way even better. But if it doesn't, by the time we die, then we die just that one time. And we'll live forever with him. And in the meantime, we have victory over Satan. He cannot make us do anything that we don't choose to do. Not Satan. He's not sovereign. He's a fallen angel. He is far lower than our sovereign Lord. So wrapped up in all of Christ's exaltation to the right hand of the throne of God is this victory over death. And from this, we get our own victory over death, which is eternal life, as well as victory over Satan. He rules the world, but not us. And this is why it's so exciting to be able to say that our Lord Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and will never die again and is no longer under the dominion or mastery of death. And we're going to see in just a bit our victory over sin through Christ. So that's Christ's exaltation. In verses 10 and 11, we see our existence. What is our existence now? How do we exist? Where do we exist? Within whom we exist? Verses 10 and 11, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. As Christians, our very existence is now wrapped up in the person of who? Jesus Christ. That's right. We've already seen how he conquered death through his sacrifice on the cross, but what he also did was conquer sin for us. His death and resurrection met the requirements for sin's penalty, and broke sin's power over us. In 1 John 5, 18, we read 19 a little bit to see victory over Satan, but in 1 John 5, 18, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, the key thing here is that the Greek language is a far more beautiful language than our English. It's more descriptive. So when you hear we know that no one who is born of God sins, what it's talking about is perpetual, habitual continuation in sin. No change from the old person. Remember, that was supposed to be an old man or an old woman that was thrown off and changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if there was no change, then we're not of God. But if there is a change and our sinning is merely stumbling now, we're walking in the path of light and we stumble into darkness, that's a different matter. That's not what that's talking about. We know that no one who is born of God sins, remains in perpetual, deliberate, continual sin. But he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. And he who was born of God is referring to Christ. So sin does not touch him. The evil one doesn't touch us. We have victory over sin, as well as death and Satan. And the driving force here, we see that in verse... Uh, well, the driving force, excuse me, behind what Jesus did was to bring glory to God. He always sought to glorify God and not himself. And it's because God so loved us while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us as a way to glorify God. Perfect example for us. In John 7, 18, Jesus teaches, He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. And he's referencing himself. He was saying, all I do is want to bring him glory. I don't want to bring myself glory. If he wanted to bring himself glory, folks, he wouldn't have gone 
and died on a cross. Because that kind of religion doesn't bring you yourself glory. If, it's, if this is all fake, by the way, if it's all fake, we're to be the most pitied, is what Paul said. But it was from a real, 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 uh, total hypothetical point of view that could never happen. Because we know it's real. But if it was all fake, well, how would Jesus have any glory at all? He would be dead. He would be a, just a man that died. Now, Muhammad, Muhammad sought his own glory, right? Married a bunch of little girls, because that was somehow glorious for him. Got to have lots of money, went out and conquered different groups of people. He lived in some glory for however many years he lived. Jesus only ministered from the age of 30 to 33. I turned 30 in March, right? He, he didn't live to be a wise and old man on this earth, because he lives for eternity. He didn't have to do that. And he doesn't seek his own glory. He seeks to glorify the Father. It's an example for us. In the same way, we have to view our very existence as being due to God, recognizing our status now, our existence now, our status, as being dead to sin and alive to the Lord through his Son, Jesus Christ. And alive to God means actually doing what his word tells us to. Faith in Christ as our Redeemer completes the salvation process. We're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. And that completes the redemption process. But all too often, Christians just stop there. We stop. Well, we're saved. We've got the uh, get-a-jail-free card from Monopoly. We're good to go. We don't need to play anymore. Christians can become cold, stone-like, with no real proof of their lives, or in their lives, of the awesome power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within. Now, Paul said that we're supposed to be, we're, we're jars of clay, he said. And jars of clay were, were the most ordinary objects that you could possibly have. And you normally didn't store treasures inside jars of clay because you couldn't see the treasure if it was inside a jar of clay. You normally stored them in, you know, something that's polished in clear crystal or glass. But we have this treasure stored up inside us. Normally jars of clay was, you know, a bathroom or a trash can. But we have this treasure of the Holy Spirit. If we're not showing that, there's something wrong with us. I'm not suggesting that there isn't salvation, although Jesus did say there's going to be people in the end times that are going to say, Lord, Lord, I did all this stuff in your name, but they did it for the wrong reason. He says, I never knew you. Get away from me. But I would say that a lot of people who are saved don't let the light shine. They hide under a bushel, or they let Satan blow it out, or they don't shine it all around Imperial, because that's how they taught me when I was a kid, to sing that song. And we have to do that. In James 2, 14 through 17, you guys know that passage. Go ahead and turn there, actually, with me, if you would. James 2, 14 through 17. It was right after Hebrews. James 2, 14 through 17. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And ladies and gentlemen, this, this can happen even if the church looks lively. Remember in Revelation, we're given an example of a church that had the reputation for being alive, but God said was dead. And right here we hear from the Lord through James that faith without works is dead. So whatever life that church appeared to have was certainly not in a manner that was according to God's word, obeying God. And we get just one example in this passage, right? Generous hospitality toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the example that's given in this passage. But it certainly doesn't end there. We're told in Scripture, for example to be loving toward one another, to edify one another, to take care of our pastor, to defend the truth of God's word, to go and make disciples of the Lord, to give all we can in service and glory and worship of our God, the one and only true living God. And the list goes on. Are we doing those things? Are we working out our salvation? Not, working, not, not being saved by works. There's a clear distinction. 
when we're saved. It's called working out your salvation when we now act the part. If we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we need to show that light. Are we working out our salvation, letting the light of the Lord shine forth through us, or are we being content with being cold, possibly even legalistic, going through rituals or traditions, going through the motions? Because that kind of faith is considered by God to be dead. We just read that in James. And we're told here in Romans 6, you can go back to Romans 6, we're told in Romans 6 that we're to be, what, dead to God or alive to God? Alive! We sound kind of dead in here right now. I hope we're not. Okay. Alive to God. That's right. It's an exciting thing to be able to say that we can be alive to God. And note, though, what we just read in James, what did it say? It was talking about your brothers or sisters. And whenever you hear that context in the epistles, that's talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. So note that lively faith begins right here in the local body of Christ, in this church. That church in Revelation that had a reputation of being alive, but was really dead on the inside, perhaps the reason was because they were too busy going out, trying to look lively to everybody outside the church, and they just had no love for each other. It's a possibility. But in any case, James's example was to clothe and feed a brother or sister in the faith. Not just to pray for them. Praying for them is good. But he said, don't just say, oh, okay, I'll pray that you find, find a, you know, somewhere to live. And you get clothes and you get some good food too. Without doing anything? Without even offering something? So let's start with this living faith right here and right now. It's all due to our existence in Christ. All due to our existence in Christ. In Christ, again, that was verse 10, 11. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Notice past tense versus present. He died to sin, he lives to God. We died to sin, we live to God. Continual. And even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we have his exaltation, Christ's exaltation. We have our existence, what that means right now. Now we have his expectations. He has expectations for us. And I think we're aware of that. But here's a real good generalized couple of verses. Instead of a list. Instead of a list of sins, here's a good generalized couple of verses. Lists of sin are very good to understand. As long as you don't look at them and try to figure out which one of them you're not doing. Right? We need to figure out. When we see a list of sin, we're supposed to look at them and go, okay, which one of these am I guilty of? But this is a generalized one. 12 and 13. His expectations. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So we're to be aware, and we're being reminded here, that we're now alive in God through Christ Jesus and we need to behave accordingly, which means we must be dead to sin. Dead for reals, not just saying it out loud. And this leads to a couple of expectations for us. First off, it means not letting sin have mastery, dominion, kingship over our mortal bodies. It says don't let sin reign in your mortal body. The mortal body is the only area where sin can still find a believer vulnerable. We're invulnerable everywhere else. We can't be possessed by Satan or any of his demons. We're protected there. Completely and utterly. That can never happen. And we also cannot be completely given over to our sins if we're truly saved. That only happens to those who are depraved. God will give them over to their depravity. But we can still stumble. We shouldn't, but it's still possible. That's where we're still vulnerable, and it's in our mortal body. Letting sin reign means making it a habit to sin. Practicing it until sin becomes a sort of perverted king over our mortal bodies. We are not to do that. And what's the result of letting sin reign? We end up obeying those lusts, those desires, those passions, rather than obeying God. Remember that when we see lust in the Bible, unfortunately, this perverted society we live in always wants to bring sexual lust to our minds. And that's certainly included, but any lust is just your passion or your desire. If you, if you have a desire to watch a football game instead of obeying the Lord by congregating at church, for instance. And it's possible for you to, you know, you have gas, your car's not broken down, you live close enough that you could walk, someone can pick you up, you know, all that good stuff. 
That's a desire. You let a lust, you obey the lust rather than obeying God. One example, very small one, okay? I did that a lot in college. I'm super embarrassed by that. I did that a lot. So that's the result. We end up obeying those sins, those lusts, those desires and passions, rather than obeying God. Because like I said, we make sin into some kind of perverted king over our mortal bodies when we practice it. And that's God's first expectation here, to remember that Jesus Christ is our king, not sin. And we should obey him, not the lusts produced by sin. The second expectation of God, now that we're alive in him through Christ Jesus, is to commit ourselves wholly to him. It says here that we have members, and it refers to them as instruments. My mind first thought, you know, like a guitar, but it didn't mean that. I looked at the Greek word, and it means weapons of warfare, that kind of instrument, tools for warfare. So real quick, let's look at some of those members that God is telling us to not use as weapons for warfare for the sake of unrighteousness, but to use as weapons of warfare for the sake of righteousness in his name. First, our brains and our thinking processes. That's part of our mortal body. Matthew 5, 27 through 28 says, that's, this is Jesus talking, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, that's everybody, right? Or vice versa, of course, for women to have looked at a man just once with lust in their heart. That, that's a good amount. If you go and watch, those of you here for Sunday school, you watched a video by, by Ray Comfort, and if you've ever watched his, his evangelism series, The Way of the Master that he does with Kirk Cameron, that's what they always do, is they start off asking people if they can list off the Ten Commandments. And then they go through, they ask him, so, you know, would you still go to heaven according to those? And some say, yeah, 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 I've been a good guy, I've been a good person. And they start listing them, and they explain that adultery is just looking at somebody with lust in your eyes. Boy, that gets most of them right off the bat. They go on with lying. Have you ever told just one lie, even if you call it a white lie? Yep. Oh, there you go. You broke the law. And in James, it says that if we break one law, we're guilty of them all. So there you go. Our brains and thinking process, they're part of the body. If we look at someone with lust in our eyes, that's adultery. That's an example of sin in our mind. In First Chronicles 20, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a real person. Okay? That includes computer. That includes porn. That is looking on someone with lust in your mind. And unfortunately, that is happening more and more and more. In First Chronicles 28.9, David said, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Every intent of the thoughts. In the days of Noah, in Genesis 6, 5-6, we're told, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And Jesus told the Pharisees, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. That's the very first one. Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slander. Even before murder, Jesus said, evil thoughts. That's where it starts. So our minds, our thought patterns, our thinking processes, that's part of the mortal body. So that's one. Our thoughts, our members, are instruments of the body, they're hidden to all but God. They're still weapons of warfare that we need to make sure are only for righteousness. Another one, Jesus' word to the Pharisees that we just saw, he pointed out things that proceed out of the mouth. Of course, our tongue is part of the body. Uh, turn to James 3 with me real quick. Are you guys hanging in there? James 3. James 3. I'm going to look at verses 1 through 8. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they may obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Behold, the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame 
by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very word of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Let's go ahead and go back to Romans 6. So we see definitely our tongue is a member of the body that would run rampant with evil without God in our lives. It would go nuts. I know that part of the forest fire, we're here in the desert, but we live close enough to see whenever those terrible things happen in, in, a, in a manzanita forest with all the manzanita trees and, of course, in Julian and those fires. We could see them down here. And if you had a, a friend or neighbor or a, a family member that was in a local fire department, then you knew that they went up there to help with those too. So we still know, and it's always something small. It's not like someone goes out there and, and throws a bunch of gasoline and creates a gigantic bonfire and lets it start. It's always, you know, a cigarette or a small campfire that was left going. They, didn't, they weren't Boy Scouts, I guess. They didn't, you know, water and sand and get rid of that. But that's how our tongue is. It'll just run rampant with evil without God in our lives. So our minds, thoughts, words, our very bodies, of course, are also vulnerable to sin. Go ahead and go to Galatians with me. Galatians 5. Whenever a pastor asks us to go to different passages, I'm always happy, first of all, because I think that's the best way to do it. We need to see. We need to see where, where this is coming from in God's word. But, uh, but uh, half of me always is ready to jump up because I think it's a sword drill that my grandpa used to do with us when we were kids. He'd say this, and we'd have to go and open up our Bibles, and whoever got it first could stand up and read it. Galatians five nineteen through 21. And here's a list of sin. It's uh, not exclusive, it's inclusive. But here's some examples, things that are from the flesh. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousings, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, don't turn back to Romans 6, because we're going to look at some surrounding verses in just a second. But real quick, a good way to think of it is to not let sin reign in our thoughts, words, and actions. Our thoughts, words, and actions. To not use our thoughts, words, and actions as weapons of unrighteousness, but rather as weapons of righteousness to God. And we have to buy into that first. Are we bought into it? Do we agree? This is something God wants us to do? We have to buy into it before we can do it, before we can even see how to. And we're going to look at that right now. How are we to accomplish this great task? It begins by presenting ourselves as such. And when you see that word present, that's another word for submit. We need to submit ourselves to the Lord. Present ourselves as these lowly creatures that do not deserve redemption, that do not deserve communication with Him through prayer, that do not deserve to have His revealed Word sitting in our laps. We need to present ourselves as such, saying, okay, God, do something with me all for your glory. Submit ourselves to God. We have to put to death those fleshly desires, those evil thoughts, and that tongue of wildfire. And we see how this is possible by looking at what we just read in Galatians 5 in context, by reading verses 16 through 26 instead of just 19 through 21. So here we go, 16 through 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousings, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's referring to unregenerate people. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk 
by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And here again is that reassuring statement of life in God. Now we have to act out that new life in Him by choosing to read His Word and obeying Him with all of our thoughts, words, and deeds, as if they were instruments of warfare used in service to our King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. As we turn back to Romans 6, remember that He has saved us by grace through faith in Him, and that's why we're now free from sin, dead to sin, alive to God through Jesus Christ. And that's now our, I had to really dig into the thesaurus for this one, our extrication, our extrication. Do we know what that means? Our extrication. That's like when, when uh, um, you have, a, you had like the Navy SEALs went a few years ago and took down the, the pirates, right? Remember that? Not with swords and stuff, of course, but you think of SEALs versus pirates and it puts like a really funny cartoon in your mind. Um, but, you know, the big Navy SEALs and they did that simultaneously. I talked to the guy that trained those when I was working at the newspaper. I talked to him on the phone. He was wanting to bring the Win Zero Project down here to train people how to be, you know, police snipers and military snipers. And he told me that it was a simultaneous shot with three fifty caliber Barrett rifles. And it was all under, through the hole. They had to use thermal imagery to make sure they could see through and see the heat sensors. And they had to figure out which one was the captain, the good guy, so that they didn't get him. And he said it took a lot of work, waves and everything, going up and down, computer laptops out so that they can get the trajectory, the Coriolis effect, the wind, all the physics of it, because it's not like a video game, right? There's a lot going into it. And man, they took care of it, right? And they extricated that captain. They saved him. They redeemed him. Even more so, here's our extrication. Verse 14 of Romans 6. I hope you guys went back there. Romans 6, verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And this is our extrication from the dominion of sin, our redemption from a life of helpless servitude towards sin and the penalty that would await those sins. Later on in Romans 6, 22 through 23, we read, But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, before, we were under God's law in the sense that we were totally helpless to live up to His standard. And I mentioned it already before, but which of us have actually kept all ten commandments perfectly? And you have to keep all ten. You can't just, you know, keep nine and a half. You have to keep all ten totally, right? You shall not have any other gods before Him. You shall not worship idols. You shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. None of us, none of us have ever kept that. It's a perfect standard that we could actually never live up to. And that's why ever since Adam, we were subject to sin. We could not measure up to God's perfect law. And we were thus deserving of the punishment for those sins, which would be an eternity in hell. And we teach that to our wanna kids, by the way. I keep waiting for a parent to come back to me and go, you taught that my son or daughter should be going to hell? Well, yeah, because if they don't understand that, then how can they understand grace? How they, can they understand that? They can't. None of us can. We have to know that that's where we were headed as soon as we sinned, as soon as we knowingly sinned. We were responsible for that sin. But now, Jesus Christ has fulfilled God's perfect law, sacrificing himself on the cross as an atonement for our sins. Positionally, this means the punishment for our sins has been taken care of by Christ. The debt completely erased and our freedom from death assured. And that should be enough to drive us forward. It should be enough. The fact that we serve a Christ who is now sitting at the right, thro- right, hand, throne of God, uh, right hand of the throne of God with a scepter of, run, of, of righteousness in his hand, defeating all unrighteousness and putting all of his enemies under his feet should be enough to follow him. But we still get the practical consideration from verse 14 when it says that sin, sin not, shall not be a master over you. Practically, as in day to day, this means we are free from a lifestyle of sin because through Christ we have that victory, that Nike, the Nike, over sin and Satan. And thus we are now said to be under grace And we must live that way. 
So this morning we, this morning and, and five minutes of afternoon, we are now reminded of the exaltation of Christ, why he is worthy to be worshipped. We're now reminded of our existence, that thanks to him, we are dead to sin and alive to God. We're now reminded of his expectations for us, that we should no longer sin with our thoughts, words, or actions, but we should submit our entire selves to him. That is true worship, according to Romans 12. And we are now reminded of our extrication from the slavery of sin into the chains of Christ. And I would much rather be chained to his perfectly pure being than be a slave to the corruption and perversion of sin. Now perhaps you're here today and you know that you've asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but you're struggling with letting go of a particular sin. And if you are that person, then just pray that God will draw you to him through his word, and then make the decision to commit yourselves fully to him. Don't go halfway. Don't go three quarters. Don't go nine tenths. Go all the way. Full commitment. And perhaps you're here today and you don't know whether you will be going to heaven when you die or you don't know whether you would be left behind at the rapture of the church. There's no better time than today to submit yourself to him and ensure your eternal life with our Lord. Now is the day of salvation. And if you're that person, just pray that God forgive you of your sins as you proclaim your trust in Christ Jesus as the only means of salvation, the only one. Because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. Him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's what Jesus said. So do that today, right now as we close in prayer. And if you do make that proclamation, I am encourage you to take a couple minutes after service to talk with one of our elders talk to Mr. Orman or Mr. Malin or myself if you'd like to. All right? Um, talk to Mel as our, as our uh, head deacon if you would like to do that. Really encourage you to do that. It'll just take a couple minutes and, and we want to, if you make the decision, we want to welcome you into the family of God. Um, let's go ahead and, and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for seeing, just looking past our imperfections, Lord and somehow, somehow still desiring to love us, still desiring that we should be with you, Lord. As terrible of people as we are without you, you still chose to love us first. And we can't thank you enough for that. God, please help those of us who are already in the fold, that are in the faith, to throw off that old person each day as they try to creep back in, as Satan tries to tempt us, as the world tries to peer pressure us and as our own flesh just tries to get away with disobeying you. Help us not to do so, Lord. Help us to commit our thoughts and our words and our actions to you, all of them. And Lord, if there is anyone that is right now wanting to ask you into their heart or they're not sure if they really want to, please reach down to them and make that happen, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. We ask again that you will heal pastor quickly, Lord, and, and all of those who are sick and that you'll protect the rest from what's going around. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.